Are you thinking about making the investment into solar? But before you make the move, you want answers. Like, how do you prepare for an install? What steps does the solar company do to prepare for the install? Well, Renew Energy Solutions serves both North Carolina and South Carolina and has completed over 4,100 high-quality solar energy installations. John Sheldon from Renew Energy is going to help answer some of your solar questions coming up next. Hello, Maria. Hi, John. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you. It's good to be with you. I'm really excited. So tell me a little bit about Renew Energy Solutions and what kind of projects you guys are working on right now. Yeah, sure. Renew Energy Solutions uh, was founded in 2010. We're based in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, we are a turnkey solar installer and we perform installations for residential and commercial customers. In addition to solar, we also install energy storage and electric vehicle chargers. We primarily focus on the Southeast. We have around 5,000 installations now, all of our own team members, operations, rooftop electricians. And uh, we are excited about every single project that we do and look forward to uh, really empowering the Southeast even more. A lot of people are considering solar right now just for the energy savings, but also for the you know, the renewable energy aspect of it and, and carbon footprint. What are some of the common questions that you get from people considering working uh, with your company? Yeah, there's there's definitely some common questions that we hear where people are curious around, you know, how much does it save you? Does it actually work? Are there any incentives? Um, how long does it take for the installation to actually happen? If I say yes today, how long before I can get it? Uh, so there's there's definitely some common questions on the residential side and, and even on the commercial side, there's a lot of businesses that are considering solar and looking into how it might offset their carbon footprint, uh, do their social justice. So they're always looking into, you know, some of those things around, hey, what's the incentives? How does this work with us, uh, with our facilities? And so we have two different businesses that focus on both of those. And uh, we have a lot of experience in each. And it's, it's one where we hope to educate the homeowner and the business owner uh, and give them all the facts and be transparent and honest up front with the information because it can be quite confusing. And so we try to go at their speed, right, and provide the information that they need in that moment. Yeah, that's important to do, isn't it? How sure. would a residential or even a commercial property, how would they prepare for an upcoming solar installation? What do they need to do? Do they need... Uh, can they use their current roof? Does it have to be so many years old? That type of thing. Sure. There's actually a lot of different uh, things to consider when, well, let's just take a homeowner. When a homeowner is looking into it, you know, they might get an electric bill that's more expensive than what they were considering, which maybe initiated their interest in looking into it. Or maybe they're getting a new roof or having some trees trimmed, you know, it just sort of starts looking into it. Uh, nowadays, actually, we see a lot of people looking into it for energy storage and backup energy uh, in place of a generator. And so when you're looking at um, what it actually takes, you know, you're going to consider things like sunlight hours per day. How many hours of sunlight does your roof or ground get? Uh, is your roof in a, in a point in its life that it maybe needs to be replaced prior to uh, being installed with solar panels? You're also considering things like tax credits because Last year, the federal tax credit was extended and it's 30% of a system's cost that a homeowner could recoup. And you know you may wanna look into your tax appetite, uh, perhaps speak with your CPA uh, about that if you're considering it for tax reasons. And, and perhaps also just your longevity. How long do you plan on being in the home? Do you plan on selling the home? Is there things that you, know, you wanna do to improve the resellability of your home? Uh, so perhaps other projects. And and when you're going into um, a buying decision like solar, you're going to want to do your research on the products that you're getting, the warranties that you're getting, and really on the installer who's putting it in because different installation companies have uh, different methods. And so there's, there's uh, some companies that are going to give you that information 
up front and some of them are going to kind of string it along. So finding the right installer is going to really mean a lot to the homeowner uh, in the long run. What goes on behind the scenes at your company as you're preparing, let's say, for an upcoming install? I would imagine you're looking at direction, the pitch and angle of the sh of the roof, that kind of thing. Yeah, sure. So uh, it starts with the consultation over the phone with one of our energy consultants who's going to pull up the home on satellite, take a look at the available roof or ground space, consider shading and roof space. Uh, for a system, they're also going to look at the energy usage in the home and figure out, hey, based off your average power bill, here's the approximate system size you'll need, um, and then look for ways to make that fit. They'll also go into ways in which a homeowner might be thinking about acquiring a system, whether it's through a cash or a finance option. And, you know, assuming these dots start to connect, then they're going to set up a time for a consultant to actually meet with them and create a custom 3D design of their home, and it'll consider a year's worth of sunlight on the home. So we get a very clear understanding up front of how much power can be produced. And we mirror that with how much power the home needs. And we figure out if it's going to meet all of their needs or a portion of their needs. And if that's going to help them hit the goals that they have. And if the customer says, yes, I want to move forward. We have a whole operations team who will handle things like interconnections with the utility company, all the paperwork to submit uh, for approvals for that. We have engineers who will design the system so that they create the, the line diagram and the blueprint uh, that can be used for a permit application. Uh, we also have project coordinators who are lining up inspections for the project because uh, the utility has to come out and inspect and make sure that it meets the requirements. There's also code inspections, making sure that it is code compliant as well. And then we also have, a, if needed, a homeowners association specialist who is going to work with the homeowners association to get approvals for this type of project. Uh, and then it goes in the warehouse and purchasing and finance. Uh, there's a whole back office of support to, to get that project over the finish line. And then ultimately everybody knows about the installers the day of who right. are really Everyone's the happy to see them. <laughs> yeah, they're the players <laughs> on the field, right? They're, everybody's right. excited, it's, it's happening, yeah. it's happening. Um, and then of course there's also site surveys uh, so we have engineers who come out and do all the measurements, uh, make sure everything's going to fit the way that we expect it to. They'll get up on the roof. They'll right. look at the shading. They'll take the exact measurements of distances between vent pipes and chimneys, things like that, Yeah. Uh, to just make sure there's no, no changes. And if there are changes, presenting that to the homeowner and letting them know, um, you know what those changes are. Perhaps a panel doesn't fit where you thought it would or... Uh, you know, we need to move it to a different orientation because the HOA wants it on a different roof plane. So, you know, there's a lot of that sort of prep work that goes into it uh, that yeah. a lot of people don't see. But um, typically it could take six to eight weeks uh, from the time a homeowner agrees to do an installation uh, to the time it's actually installed. So. so six to eight weeks, because when I had my solar array installed on my roof, there were people coming and going, just coming to look on the yard and look on up at the roof. And there are all kinds of studies that were being taken. And, you know, I really appreciated that. You could tell there were a lot of moving parts behind the scenes um, before the installer showed up. Because it's not like getting a hot water heater installed. It's a little bit different than that. Completely. Yeah, it's a home improvement project. You know, it requires electrical permits. It requires construction permits. So it's it's a permanent fixture set on that property. Uh, and because of that, there's a lot of hoops that need to be jumped through to to make it happen. And and in some cases, it just doesn't line up. Um, you know, certain things aren't uh, approved, or inspections aren't passed, or you know, the system's not going to produce what we were anticipating. Um, and so uh, sometimes there are some letdowns with it once you get past that initial phase of I want to do this, you know, to where you get to where like, let's actually look at the site, get boots on the roof, measure these things and confirm things are going to go the way we expect them to. Uh, but most of the time it does. Uh, but there are some instances where, you know, for instance, a homeowners association says you can't put it on the front of your home. It has to go on the back of your home. Well, if the front of your home faces south, and the back faces due north, in this hemisphere, you want it facing south towards the equator, which goes all the time, right? Uh, so putting it on the north side, it's not as much sunlight to create as much power, uh, which will change how much energy it's going to offset from the home's consumption. And um, that may be a deal breaker for a homeowner. And they may say, you know what, I, I, you know, 
I want to move to a place without an HOA or something and get a system there, but yes. uh, <laughs> it happens. Well, it's better to find out sooner rather Correct. than later. Yes. You know, to be a whole world of hurt going ahead. Yeah, and in those cases, we let the homeowner off the hook. I mean, there's no obligation if the whole HOA says you can't have it. There's no penalty fees or fines that renew will push onto the homeowner. You know, it's just circumstantial. And, and that's why we have uh, a dedicated team just focusing on getting things the way that HOA likes to see them. We send them a whole binder of information so that they're aware because a lot of times, you know, those decision boards aren't familiar with solar and aren't familiar with uh, the CCNRs and how their their covenant reviews and views solar panels. They think of them as satellite dishes. Um, so there's a lot of education just in that front too that we provide. Um, and our, our pass rate is greater than 80%. So um, there's really... Uh, it's far and few between with the failures of HOA approvals. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt here, but did you know that this podcast is a passion project of sociable media? And this is where I get to do a shameless plug for our services. Sociable media is a digital marketing agency that works with clients in the renewable energy sector. We design websites, manage social media, run ad campaigns, write content, all that sort of digital marketing stuff. I just want to throw that in there. Now back to the podcast. What are the most common myths or the the untruths that are still floating around out there? Um, yeah, there's, hear there's a lot, to be honest. <laughs> uh, I've been doing yeah. this 16 years. I feel like I still answer some of the same questions uh, I was answering back in the day. Yeah. But uh, it's great because everybody's got to get on the same page. So uh, you meet people where they're at in this process. But, you know, you may have stuff like, hey, if the power goes out and I have solar panels, I'm still going to have power. You know, and the truth is, without a battery system, you're not going to have power because if the grid gets uh, shut off, they're going to turn off the power to the home and to the solar system. And the reason being is for safety. You have linemen out there fixing the damage to the electrical power lines. Uh, if you're sending power back to them, you could cause an electrical shock. Uh, so they automatically will rapidly shut down the solar system for the protection of the crew who's gonna repair the grid. So if you have a battery system, then sure, the battery will kick on seamlessly and start to you know power the home and pick up as if nothing was, was going on for the most part. Um, and so that's a common myth. I got solar, you know, I'm, I'm not going to have a power outage. Uh, not the case without a battery. If you have a battery, you're good. That, yeah, I had to admit that I, I had that idea too. I was like, wow, great. You know, we're going to be good during a storm. Not so fast. Not so fast. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's one extra step. We're halfway there, right? Uh, <laughs> Get an energy storage, like the Tesla battery behind oh, you. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah. Tesla, Franklin. I mean, there's a lot of makers of batteries nowadays, so it's very practical. Yes. It's got a lot of use cases, so it's come a long way. It's no longer just car batteries kind of stacked up in a garage, you know, uh, <laughs> hot wired together. Yeah. Um, that's not the case anymore. It, it is still some cases, but majority of homeowners nowadays are getting one of the units behind us. And, um, you know, they're the ones who are, are benefiting from this sort of uh, peace of mind and energy security in the event of an outage or something and severe storm. Um, but there's other myths too, right? Like does a panel even work if it's cloudy or if it's rainy? And the truth is, yes, like it will still produce power. It's not dark out, right? I mean, there's still UV light being being uh, projected out there, even on cloudy, rainy days. So it's enough to produce something. Um, it may not be peak power, like, you know, direct sunlight, sunny day, no clouds, but it's still going to create energy and it's still going to contribute to the overall uh, systems production for the year. And, uh, you know, other myths that come along with it are, are some common things that you might see like, oh, uh, solar just doesn't work or it's not practical. It's, it's, it just doesn't fit. You know, it's, it, the panels are too big or too small. It's, it's kind of all over the map. And, and the truth is like solar is so viable. And there's so many options and different panel sizes, you know, just because a panel is a three foot by five foot footprint you know, those panels have over time produced more power in that same footprint. The cell technology has become more efficient. So even though it's, you know, 15 square feet, let's say, you know, whereas 15 years ago it was maybe 175 watts. Nowadays, you're looking at over 400 watts. And and that's, you know, a pretty tremendous impact and growth. And, and that's where, you know, you start to realize you don't need as many panels uh, as what you maybe had thought you might have needed. On top of that, you're also able to monitor these panels. So 
another myth is like you don't know if these things are working um and and that's you know really being debunked by the fact that you could pull up an app on your phone or on your computer and see the production of that panel in real time um and it, it really just puts the power in people's con uh, fingertips and there's no curiosity around that so uh, you know it's just there's a whole host of things those are some of the most popular ones and common ones but um, the truth is, I mean, it gets us from A to B, you know, it's, it's like cell phones, right? The first cell phone was still able to make phone calls, right? Maybe not create a video or, or surf the internet, but nowadays, you know, you're still able to, um, with a solar panel that we have today, offset your power and save money on your electric bill, reduce your carbon footprint. We don't need to wait until something greater and bigger. All that is like nice to have, but we have very functioning equipment today. Um, that's really making a positive impact. For somebody who is interested in going solar, making making the investment, going ahead with it, what would you tell them? What would be the you know the top two or three benefits other than probably rebates? You know, there's lots of really great Incentive. advantages yeah. to it all. So, so what would I tell them about like what to look forward to with it? Yeah, or, you know, the reasons why, you know, someone should consider solar. Yeah, I, I think when you go through history, prices have continued to increase from the utility companies, right? So we can't predict the future, but we can certainly look back and see, okay, you know, the power in 1950 is not what was much less expensive per kilowatt hour than the power in 2023, right? So there's maybe been some of this up and down over time, right? But overall, the trend line shows power has increased uh, in cost, right? So you're looking at the advantage of sort of level setting your increasing costs. Electricity is a staple of every home's monthly budget. Um, and the more control you can have over your monthly expenses, the better you are to allocate, you know, your disposable income to other things, right? Um, and, and ultimately save and invest and, and generate wealth. Well, you know, if you're able to fix your cost per kilowatt hour having a solar system, right, that's meeting your energy needs, you're really avoiding those future increases of, of what power is is most likely to do. Can't guarantee it, but ultimately, if we if we take what we what the history has shown us and apply it going forward, there's going to be this delta between what you're spending on your solar and what you would have spent if you didn't have solar uh, from your tr from your traditional utility company. So, you know, your future proofing yourself uh, against rising energy rates, which goes a long way with people who are getting into retirement years and they have fixed incomes and they want to make sure that they can, you know, live comfortably. Um, solar is a great option for them, you know, especially if they still have uh, income tax liability so they can still take advantage of the tax credits. Um, you know, if you're already retired and you don't pay income tax, well, maybe it's not as advantageous, right, at that point. So we talked to a lot of customers looking into it uh, as they're kind of setting their sights on retirement years. But also, you know, you look at resellability of homes nowadays. You know, there's a lot of homes that have solar. There's enough of them out there that most people have seen them, you know, and it's not just like this sort of like, uh, what is that taboo type thing? It's, hey, that's interesting. What's that about? Well, those homes, when they go onto the market, are more appealing because they have a lower electric bill. And the homeowner who's moving into that home had to do nothing to be able to get solar from the day they stepped foot in the door. They didn't have to do their research on contractors and all this other stuff, wait for permits and installation and stuff like that. So there's a convenience being passed on to the secondary home buyer or, and then every home buyer after that, third, fourth, fifth. I mean, these systems last over 20 years, right? So some of them may change hands several times. And, and every time that your home uh, with solar is on the market, you're you're basically putting yourself into an advantage over one without solar. Um, you add batteries into that equation as well, and the resale value is is really uh, significant. I mean, we're seeing over five percent uh, increases on the resale value of these systems, and it's becoming more commonplace. So you know where we're where we're kind of uh, needing more education is along the lines of real estate agents and and uh, appraisers, so that they on a broad scale, understand the values of having a lower electric bill, fixed electric bill, things of that nature, uh, because you know then it's then it's less subjective. Uh, when it's subjective, you got 
you got people who maybe or maybe don't value it, right? And that's where you start getting people to say, oh, um, you don't get anything out of the resale of your home if you add solar. Well, it, right now that may be true because it can be case by case depending on the market. Um, so it's not a blanket uh, statement that every place is going to increase the home value where they're solar. Um, it, it would be great to get to that point. But currently it is something that we would talk about in the Carolinas because there are people seeing the benefits of of selling their home with solar and a battery and, and getting more for it and selling it faster, right? You get competing offers, which drives up the price as well. So those would be a couple of things I'd say, future proof and resellability for sure. Your area is adopting terms of use, yes. which is net metering. And, and you know, that offsets energy use. Um, how does that af- How does that benefit? You know, how is that a good thing? Yeah. So net metering is is your one-to-one energy credits, right? So it's kind of like in-store credit with your utility company. I uh, You give them a, a kilowatt hour, say 10 cents. Uh, you know, they're going to credit your account with them 10 cents, right? At nighttime, you need the kilowatt hour back because the sun's down. You know, they're going to pass it back to you. And so you basically wash it out, right? Negate. I give one, I get one, that type of thing. And that goes on every single day every single week, month, you know, then some cases they have an annual kind of true up where it says, okay, what did you give us? What did you get from us? And, you know, if you uh, gave them more than what you took, then, you know, they may credit your account uh, with a difference, right? Maybe it's, you know, two cents for every kilowatt hour or something like 20 bucks or 200 bucks. It it fluctuates, right? But that's the principle, right? There's this buying and giving and and it's kind of trading of energy, right? Uh, And time of use, that 10 cents at different times of day, say middle of the day, like right now, it's almost three o'clock. This is a pretty busy hour. You got businesses running, um, schools are going, you know, there's there's people who are home. Uh, so energy demand is, is, is up at this time of day. And so the old grids uh, option is, hey, I need to um, start firing up some more peak power plants, which is pretty expensive to operate. And so that 10 cents could become, you know, 15, 20, 25 cents in some states, even more than that. Um, and then it, on the inverse of that nighttime, sun's down, people are sleeping, businesses are closed. That 10 cents could be more like two cents or four or five cents, right? So it's just, it's less expensive uh, in those off peak times. And there's a middle ground, right? There's this partial peak time where it's somewhere in the middle. Um, so time of use or TOU, time of use, uh, is similar to net metering in that you're, you're giving and getting these kilowatt hour credits, right? But the price that the value of that kilowatt hour is going to fluctuate depending on the time at which you gave it to them and the time at which you got it back from them. And so that starts to change the equation of, Hey, what time should I give them kilowatt hours? What time should I get kilowatt hours? And when you combine it with a battery system, you get even more control over that uh, because if you were to, say, charge your battery during like a a partial peak or an off peak, you know, maybe six, seven at night or eight or nine in the morning, uh, you know, you're going to start charging your battery. Well, then in, say, three o'clock in the afternoon, instead of you buying power from the utility company, you're going to use your battery instead. And so you would avoid having to buy that, you know, 20, 25 cent kilowatt hour uh, because you're discharging the battery and in that time to where it'd be most expensive. Um, and then if you really wanted to, I mean, you could ideally like push the battery into the grid at that expensive time where now you're, you're, you know, you charge it at 10 cents, but you're discharging it to the grid at 25, 30 cents, right? So you're making like 2x the amount of credits into your account with the utility. So it's, it's got some economics behind it where some people choose a, a lifestyle shift where they would push back their washing and drying and, and dishes and things of that nature till those partial or, or off peak times. Um, and then, you know, bring in like the battery or, or just use little power during the, the peak time. So it's, it's a change happening. It's in the Carolinas. Uh, right now, Duke Energy is talking in North Carolina, that change going live uh, in October, um, somewhere October, in the line yeah. of October 1st, where Duke will switch from net metering over to time of use. Uh, Duke, South Carolina has been time of use already for a couple of years, and it's been going well. And we've seen the battery adoption uh, dramatically increase uh, in South Carolina as a result of that. 
Um, and we foresee that continuing in North Carolina and just overall the benefits, um, you know, of energy security, you know, weather protection from outages and, and then the benefit of, hey, maybe I make some extra money on my discharging of the battery during peak times uh, is a nice appeal as well. So, yeah. Definitely. And I agree that is definitely a, um, it's it's an activity, it's a, it's a point of thinking and being mindful of when you use your energy charging your car in the off peak yes. hours or it's doing your doing your running your dishwasher at nighttime setting your timer on so there's a lot of great uh benefits to it i love it yeah I mean, yeah it, it just took a few months to kind of switch that thinking around but then you get the knack of it and it's like okay this is pretty cool yeah you know what's great is you know you're you're able to get some more disposable income you know that you can put other places like i i have a solar system as well and i get excess credits and I mean, it's it's money that I'm not coming out of pocket for, but I um I always like to think that hey, this money I'm uh, that I'm taking my wife out to dinner with would have gone to the utility company, but instead I'm having a nice dinner here. So you know, there's 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 nice advantages to not just spending it on you know the utility because that's what you were used to. Uh, we're giving people the option to have a choice of where their energy is coming from, um, which is uh, relatively new. A line of thinking. I mean, it's kind of like when people switch from cable TV to satellite and then sort of from satellite and cable over to streaming. Um, you know, there's these sort of mind shifts happening out there with, if you have an option. Exactly. Well, John, I really appreciate sure. you taking the time to speak with me today. Yeah. I uh, wish you and, and Renew um, all the best. Thanks. And um, uh, thanks for answering a lot of questions today. Yeah, no that worries, Probably Rhea. a lot of people may have. Absolutely. Yeah. Good questions. You know, knowledge is power. So as long as it's good knowledge, like totally. let there be more power. Let's go for it. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Take good care. Thank See you, you later. Thank you so much, Rhea. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Your solar energy questions answered by John Sheldon of Renew Energy Solutions. Great guy and super knowledgeable about solar installations, eh? This podcast is sponsored by the fine people at Smart Energy, an event held every April in Canada that brings together people in the renewable energy space. I appreciate your time today. I'm your host, Maria McGowan.